In order to know more fully what the mind should do in the process of thinking and gaining knowledge, we must first understand what the mind is. What are its basic functions, activities, and capacities? In analyzing the nature of the mind, a crucial fact to be considered is this, that all mental activities fall into one of two categories. They are either conscious mental activities or subconscious mental activities. By conscious activity, we mean any mental process that is directly volitional, that is non-automatic, capable of being deliberately and immediately directed by the thinker. By subconscious activity, we refer to the automatic functions of the mind, to those functions which are not at any given instant directly open to our volitional control. It is these automatic functions that we'll discuss tonight. The automatic functions of consciousness are crucially important for us to understand because although they're not in our direct volitional control, it is nevertheless that which we do volitionally that determines whether or not those subconscious processes are efficacious and make it possible for us to gain knowledge. In this sense, we control the automatic functions indirectly. This relationship between the conscious and the subconscious is like that of the mind and a physical bodily organ. We don't directly control the action of, for instance, our digestive system. But whether or not our digestive system is able to do its work properly, to function efficiently, in the service of our physical health depends on whether we decide to feed it healthy food or undigestible scraps. And that is in our direct control. Now what do we mean when we speak of the contents of the conscious mind as opposed to the contents of the subconscious? We mean whatever is the direct, immediate object of awareness. For instance, the words I'm now speaking, and whatever thoughts you might be having about them, are part of your immediate awareness. They are what you are focusing on and thinking about at this precise moment. As I speak and my sentences go through your mind, what is in the center of the stage of consciousness, so to speak, is my last sentence. But of course, all of your knowledge and experience is not and cannot possibly be contained in your conscious mind at any given moment. What one can hold in conscious focus at any one time is tremendously limited. What I said a minute ago or last week is not now in your conscious mind, nor are you now aware of your political convictions or even of the means of transportation that brought you to this lecture tonight. Yet it obviously wouldn't be true to say that at this moment you don't know your political convictions, or that you don't know if you came here by bus, subway, or car, or that you don't know what I said a moment ago or last week. If you ask yourself what are your political ideas, how you got here tonight, what I said last week, you'll only have to concentrate a moment that is, focus your mind on the task of answering the question, and the answer will come into your conscious mind. Where then was that knowledge the moment before you asked the question and it came into your conscious mind? What does it mean to say that you possess knowledge when you're not immediately aware of that knowledge, when you're not focusing on it? It means that that knowledge is stored away in your subconscious, in your mental storehouse, the filing system, so to speak, of your conscious mind. You ask yourself a question, that question opens the appropriate file drawer, and the answer emerges into conscious awareness. 
the subconscious, to give the most general and broad statement, is that part of the psyche or mind which contains all the knowledge, premises, identifications, observations, conclusions, perceptions, memories, associations, and so on, that are not the immediate object of conscious awareness. As one means of further defining the nature of the subconscious, I want very briefly to distinguish the concept I will be presenting from the Freudian view. My reason for doing this is that the Freudian theory of the subconscious is the one to which in one form or another you have all been exposed. It is the prevalent view of the subconscious. Knowingly or by default, many of you will have absorbed part or all of it. And the failure clearly to grasp the crucial distinction between the view I will present and Freud's view can distort your understanding of other very important concepts that we'll be discussing tonight and on future nights. According to Freud, the subconscious, he called it the unconscious, is in some sense a separate mind. That is, it is not merely the case that the subconscious contains material of which the conscious mind is not cognizant, but first, it contains material which never was in the conscious mind or never was available to conscious identification. Second, it has autonomous desires and purposes of its own, unrelated to any desires or purposes ever formed by or available to the conscious mind. The subconscious is like another personality within a human being, a personality not exclusively formed by and not totally reflecting the conscious personality. It does contain one's past thinking, associations, conclusions, observations. But it also contains instincts and what Freud calls archaic urges, urges and desires that are racially inherited, common to each member of the race, present in each human being at birth, ahead of any thinking he might do. We are born with instincts, premises, desires already in our subconscious, which our conscious mind didn't place there, has not sanctioned, and knows nothing about, but which nevertheless motivate and impel us. This, of course, is Freud's concept of the id. In contradistinction to this Freudian view, our concept of the subconscious is that it contains nothing, no desires, ideas, values, premises, memories, hopes, or fears that were not placed there in some form by the action of the mind. It was Aristotle who spoke of the mind as a tabula rasa, meaning a tablet, blank at birth, on which one then writes as a result of one's observations and thinking. Similarly, we hold that the subconscious is a tabula rasa, that it is empty at birth, that it is filled by the action of the mind, that the source of its content is the mind's sensations, perceptions, identifications, evaluations. The subconscious and let me stress that any analogies of this kind are not intended to imply similarities other than those I specifically describe and shouldn't be taken to imply broader similarities, the subconscious can be likened to a vast filing system in which what one has learned and thought and experienced and observed is stored away in categorized files there to be looked at and used when required by the conscious mind. But, and this is most important, like the filing system in an office, 
the availability of the information stored in the subconscious